Sholem Aleichem, Assalamu Alaikum, Shalom Aleichem. It is me, Comrade Net Ben Yahushua, the cleric of public relations and co-founder of the Bundist movement. I'm here with Donna Newman, fellow co-founder of the Bundist movement and emissary of solidarity. Hi. That's it. This is the only way that I could be pressured into letting this embarrassing video be uploaded. I can't believe that you would say that, Comrade Net. Why not? You get to hear me at my worst. I can't believe that you would say this when you handled it so well. <sighs> I yell at the construction, constantly lose my train of thought, I end up talking to you, to Marvin, and to Uri at different points. So what, Ned? Don't be such a schmuck. Schmuck? Yes, you schmuck. Oh, those are fighting words there. Oh, Ned, you are too sensitive sometimes. It's cute. Like, you're like a dying cat with sad eyes that say, Why me? Why must I go through life without a beer or a cheese sandwich? What are you talking about? Chaos. The look on your face is priceless. There is a scowl on his face. We need to get a webcam. It would be great. Let's go ahead now. All right. We started... Yeah, I noticed. We just started watching... Um, My Mother Sold Me, Cambodia, where virginity is a commodity. A commodity. Now, uh, you see that right there, RT News, on air, live stream, uh, 24 uh, slash 7 HD. Yeah, we're doing our own experimental uh, live stream recording. Um, and it is completely experimental. Uh, it's the invention of Uri Adia and Marvin Eliyahu. So we started watching this and it's rather good. So far, um, so good. We are going to cut into it through this experimental live stream. And, um, we'll see, see how it goes. We're probably going to end on what if the entire Middle East was like Israel. Trump administration can dream as you can see on this on the RT channel again this is experimental and uh, hopefully the construction in the back row will, will, will stop it's gonna make this uh, uh, c c kind of awkward uh, no Uri that's not necessary no ตัวซุยตัวกระเจ๊ะกระเดียวยังไทยอำนาจกระดาวยังเธอออดทุกหมดชุดออดทุกหมดนี่มันนัดบ่ายกำได้ให้โอนกำได้ให้ได้ไม
U.S. China trade war, Beijing wins first round. And this should be very interesting. I hope that you guys are enjoying this and hopefully the construction will stop. Um, right now the construction's not on, but the door is open. <laughs> Long story. But yeah, the U.S.-China trade war. Beijing wins the first round on RT. The Chinese ambassador to the United States has said that Beijing has no choice but to defend itself from a trade war it doesn't want, one started by Washington. It's important to notice who started this trade war. We never want to have a trade war, but if somebody started a trade war against us, we have to respond and defend our own interests. The remarks come amid heightened tensions over months of billions worth of tit-for-tat tariffs between the world's two largest economies. One of the reasons for the trade war is Trump's anger with China's trade surplus with the United States. But despite all the punitive measures, America's trade deficit with Beijing has now in fact reached a new record. Daniel Bushell picks up the story. The supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. Sun Tzu, 6th century BC, applied by his homeland today to a different war. Trade wars, protracted trade war. The labeling of China as the enemy. Trade war continues. Game on here. A trade war between the United States and China is here. It's real. China is accusing the White House of launching the largest trade war in history. Trump slaps vicious restrictions on Beijing, yet its sales just grow to the biggest trade surplus with Washington ever. In other words, Beijing has never sold so much stuff to the states while buying so relatively little in return. America whacked tolls on China in January. Next month, Beijing only sells them more. Same after fresh US fees in July, August and September. Now panic after this month's record sales by Beijing to America. Is Trump's plan working or is he just talking the talk? China's market distortions and the way they deal cannot be tolerated. China has been attempting to interfere in our upcoming 2018 election. I've done a lot of business with China. 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 China Sea. Through China. I've been talking about China for a long time. Beijing also holds a nuclear option up the sleeve. It owns over a trillion dollars of U.S. debt. If it calls that cash in, something Washington has a problem. There are talks for a Xi Trump summit next month where a U.S. way out the Chinese finger trap can be hammered out. Till then, who'd have thunk it? Trump would make China great again. So what this means is that, of course, China is basically won the trade war uh, in, this, in this first round. And, and, and it shows that, of course, the American consumers are the ones that are going to be are paying the highest prices for this, and it's not harmed China. Uh, certainly, uh, the U.S. has no position of strength going into these talks. What China has done is uh, continue to emphasize its exports to the U.S. Uh, American importers are rushing very, very fast uh, over the last two quarters to get as much product in as possible before the tariffs hit. And China is pursuing other trade relationships to continue to uh, cause their economy to grow. So this, what this shows is that the U.S. has completely failed. All right, so far the construction's not back on. Of course, the traffic is because of the lack of the door. But um, let me just try to gather my thoughts together. Why did this have to happen today? I don't know. But uh, we're going to the cross chalk uh, blowhorns where they make the discussion of the internet purging that's been going on and the murder of Kishoshi and how this will possibly or possibly not affect American-Saudi relations. And that is a very important topic because this gets into Donna Newman's theory about even the Saudis becoming eventually distanced from the United States of America, although we should consider this, however, the first rift between the U.S. and the Saudi royals, not the end. Just like the flotilla incident was the first rift between Turkey and Israel, but it wasn't the end. 
Trump's Jerusalem decision to have the and the constructions back on. Uh, okay. I, I maybe I can finish that thought later. All right, let's go to the crosstalk bullhorns. All right. I can't believe the construct. Is this really gonna be? For Do we know when this is gonna end? <laughs> all right. Well, let's just cut into it then. All right. Okay. Let's let's cut into it. Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. Tech tyranny, you too can be disappeared in broad daylight. I would just like to say Alex Jones is not nearly as bad as David Duke or Glenn Beck. I really want to stress that really badly right now. Alex Jones is not as bad as David Duke or Glenn Beck. Seriously. If you think Alex Jones is worse than Glenn Beck, or if you think that Alex Jones is worse than David Duke, you have a serious, serious problem in the brain. Uh, I would like to state that. At least Alex Jones talked a lot about the reality behind the police state. Sometimes he fudged the little facts and got things confused, but he at times was strikingly accurate when everyone else was too scared to speak about such subjects. I, I, I want to put that out there right now. Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. Tech tyranny, you too can be disappeared in broad daylight. Also, the fate of a Saudi journalist is testing Washington's relations with Riyadh. Is the Crown Prince's rule in doubt? And much, much more on this edition of Crosstalk. Cross-talking some real news, I'm joined by my guest here in Moscow, Glenn Deason. He is a professor at the Higher School of Economics and author of The Decay of Western Civilization and the Resurgence of Russia. We also have Alex Christoforo. He's the director and writer for the Duran.com. And we have Dmitry Babich. He is a political analyst with Sputnik International. Well, all right, gentlemen, cross-talk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want, and I always appreciate it. Um, the purge has come, long expected. What do you think of the extent of it, and is this the beginning? Because we had Alex Jones yeah. was the was the tip uh, the tipping point. Now the, they're rolling the trial it out. Balloon. Alex Jones was a trial balloon. Alex Jones himself said it that they're going to come after everybody once they're done with me, and they wiped him off the internet a map, and now they've come after anti media. They went after the Free Thought Project. It's important to point out these are not just conservative sites; these are also progressive sites, and it's a. a two, three weeks before the midterms. So well, there's okay. no coincidence there. I'm glad there. you brought that up because one could make the argument that Facebook is injecting itself into the political yeah. process here because they're saying they're trying to protect the political process from these quote unquote fringes, but they're the ones that are meddling. It's also important to point out that it's not just Facebook. Twitter also suspended right. the account, so there's obvious collusion between the two companies. So, I mean, what you have here is Facebook, in my opinion, has put the final nail in their coffin. We can look at them now as a big company, but believe me, in a few years, Facebook will regret this decision. Already millennials are leaving in yeah. droves here. All right, so the other thing that this uh, is uh, getting into, uh, other than uh, the collaboration of big tech corporations silencing the independent voice, is the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, or at least the alleged murder, which is believed to be done by the Saudis. Some say the Saudi crown prince. Um, that is also to be covered here on uh, this uh, episode of Crosstalk, uh, which we have gathered this morning from the live stream. And... I think that one of the things that I want to point out is, although I often found myself in disagreement with Alex Jones, I still find it highly suspicious, despite what our 
whether he realizes it or not, we consider him a big ally, as a lot of what we believe is third worldist opinion. You know, there's this uh, guy, Jason, on the Mouse Rebel, who really doesn't care about the censorship of Alex Jones, and I understand his reasoning, but I really used to watch Alex Jones a lot, and I still maintain David Duke and Glenn Beck are both much worse. Alex Jones was just simply a little nutso, but a lot of what he said was true. If you could get past all the insane conspiracy theories, and understand that that's what he did, he marketed conspiracy theories. But, uh... Anyway, we're going to go far further with this right now. Millennials are leaving in yeah. droves here. Glenn, what is, what is the significance for you? Because it seems to me that there's an enormous amount of collusion going on here. And it's the mainstream media that is cheering this along because they want their monopoly back. They want to be able to push their competitors to the, uh, to, to the side because their ratings are way, way down. Their business model is failing. This is a, a big favor, favor to the establishment. Oh, definitely. And I think, yeah, that's how it's developed as well. And I think, yeah, Alex was right to point out that this was largely um, yeah, something that they will regret because uh, when this uh, yeah, purge of uh, uh, well, alternative voices began, uh, initially we saw that yeah, these tech companies who now established themselves as this new ministry of truth, they essentially came after the uh, foreign media first. So RT for one, where they start to manipulate the algorithms to get fewer hits and then we saw that it began to attack internal enemies as well because they have the American society become quite polarized. There is a schism between globalism and Americanism, which is why Russia is feared so much because Russia is the only big capitalist competitor that is not on the side of globalism or Americanism. Russia has, after all, the freest press in the world. The American society become quite polarized, so of course the conservatives began to complain that these very left-leaning uh, tech companies are now coming after them as well and censoring, uh, censoring the, uh, yeah, the conservatives. Uh, now, again, it continues, and I think now they're going after both left and right so uh, anti-establishment. is an equal opportunity offender, huh? <laughs> Dima, what's your take on this? They are not going after both left and right. They are going after centrist, leftist, and sections of the right-wing fringe. And neoliberals need to do that in order to maintain their perception control. That's largely what neoliberalism is about, perception control. Neoliberal, neo-fascist, neoliberal, neo and neoconservative are not fascist, liberal, or conservative. It's the economic policy that maintains neo-feudalism and neo-globalism. Uh, sorry. The construction is making it difficult, everybody. Um, let me re-say all that. The neoliberal policies that are neoliberal, neoconservative, and neo-fascist, which are not fascist, conservative, or liberal. That's not a pro-fascist statement, everyone. I'm just saying that fascism is useful to boost up hyper types of corporate capitalism. So they're not going after the left or right. If the left or the right, they're going after centrist, leftist, and sections, mind you, sections of the right-wing fringe. Uh, these tech companies are not left-leaning. These tech, ugh, that noise. These tech companies are not left-leaning. They are neoliberal, which is just as right-wing as neoconservative and neo-fascist. And by the way, neo-fascist is not fascist, while neo-Nazi is fascist. I'm very sorry about the construction that it just happens to be day to day. I'm not sure if we're ever going to do this lime stream stuff again. Yeah, Donna, take us to the next, please. Please, thank you. Dima, what's your take on this? Uh, well, I think we said it uh, a long time ago on this program, uh, you know, for many decades, uh, humanity expected fascism to come from extreme left or from extreme right. It came from the center. No, again, it came from neoliberals, and this paves the way for right-wing fringe uprisings, regardless of whether neoliberals intend for this or not. This new speak for describing left-right paradigm is harmful. This just goes to show that neoliberal policies are important to high-tech imperialism. Uh, the marketing monopoly enterprises stand much to lose from the right-wing fringes that can't toll the talking point line. The center that is falsely called the left scares them, and the left wing, uh, the left wing scares them for very, very obvious uh, reasons. You know, it doesn't take much to figure out why. It came from the center, where it was least expected. 
and and uh, look at the reactions. I mean, let me quote uh, Jason Bosler from uh, the Free Thought Project, you know, which had more than three million followers. Gone now, right? He says that this is a pre midterm purge. And I like that expression. Also, I, I just found... Uh, yeah, but, but that's in the service... That is not in the service of democracy. It is not in the service of ideas. What it is is, is to narrow the field and where they have... The, uh, Facebook is injecting itself, actually picking winners. Well, the, the, I, I just love this expression. Uh, it memory hold. Facebook memory hold a lot of interesting articles, a lot of interesting authors. It is becoming what people call a digital nanny state, you know. Uh, people were complaining a nanny state for many decades. Well, if we had a nanny state that would guarantee you education, health care, no one would be against such a nanny state. But the, the, the modern ultra-liberal nanny state, it doesn't guarantee you anything economically, but it certainly watches out. That, that you would not be influenced by politically incorrect ideas. So, but see, but Facebook and, and Twitter and others, they're determining what your value system should be. Okay, well, everything now just said here, for the most part, especially how Peter signs it off with, uh, well, it's not signed off, we've cut into this, where he says they've determined, they determine your values, that's all spot on. There's nothing to object to there. That is all spot on. You would not be influenced by politically incorrect ideas. So, but see, but Facebook and, and Twitter and others, they're determining what your value system should be. They are mandating it, and they are punishing people that don't toe the line. They are much more than a platform uh, where you can place ideas. They're, deter they're, they're, they're editors now. They're editors exactly. of social media, of the social media uh, space. When I hear about this... Every time I hear about this, I every single time I hear about this, I I'm I'm noticing that there's this debate going on, like, well, we just need more free press, which which we do, that's true. Uh, however, you hear a lot of stuff about, well, you can't turn it into a public utility that puts it in the power of the hands of the state. This is another reason why people need to understand what socialism, what socialism would be, what it is, and how it has been, because like the truth be told, forget about the private sector or the state sector. How about it being a utility for the public use of the community? That would be way more healthy. Um, that would be the answer. Just some thoughts, because our, you, you are, you are, everybody knows where this is already going. Come on. They are acting as publishers, so they should be defined as publishers, not platforms. They should not have the protection of platforms. They should be responsible for what content goes up. They should hire thousands of editors to monitor the content. They should be liable to any types of lawsuits for the content they publish. You can't have it both ways. Facebook and Twitter, in my mind, are, are finished. There's a lot of alternatives coming up now. Gab is, is crushing Twitter as far as growth. Twitter is losing users yes, yes it is. month to month. If it wasn't for Donald Trump, Twitter would not be what it is today. Donald Trump yeah, is the one that's save. giving Twitter a lot of publicity. One has to wonder if he has shares in the yeah. company. I wonder. I mean, this is an, uh, a profound moment here in social media because it seems to me that this is, you know, when it was these things were first invented and it was kind of left of center. Everyone has a uh, you know, level uh, playing field. Everyone can participate. Everyone's ideas will be um, accepted at face value. That era is over. Who says anything has to be over? The goofy truth about all of this is that the most likely thing happening is that the CIA wants to identify its rivals and and what Americanism proceeds to be a threat to the actual new world order, which is and has been nothing more, nothing less than Americanism itself. I, I don't think the concept of new ideas and everything like that has to be over. I do think there has to be a point very soon, though, where we clarify what is the truth. And everybody is just scared of certain things, such as a Jewish socialist voice, religious socialist voices, you know, in general, Jewish socialist voices in particular. I think that that's actually the stuff we scare people the most. But they don't know where we're coming from, and hopefully we'll just win and not get destroyed with black bags over our heads. Well, and I don't think there's anything to continue it. 
Well, that was the first argument when the internet came up in the 90s that uh, this would be the ultimate uh, expression of democracy. So people could express themselves, share any ideas uh, without any government control. So you have this huge power which was then uh, yeah, drifting towards the individual. And at the same time you saw the state coming in as well who wanted to harness this. So you see this with NSA. Yeah. China obviously has also had its uh, yeah, some formidable efforts in terms of controlling the internet. And I think now in the center you see the, the, the tech corporations really having this uh, huge power and uh, uh, yeah, coming essentially with their own agenda. And yeah, I wouldn't necessarily agree with what mm. Dima said that they're in the center because they are they are politically very left though if you look at the executives at Google and uh, but, but the interesting thing is that these these platforms want to determine what the center is exactly yeah. okay that's what I think is really very interesting here and and what it'll do as Alex went up people will go elsewhere all right and the interesting thing for me is that there's always been this talk about turning them into a, a utility regulating it but I think these powers using Demas mm -hmm. in the center, they want to harness it for themselves. Exactly. Of, of, of course they want to harness it for themselves. Uh, okay, the best way you can think about this is that when you think about the internet, think about radio when radio first came out. They wanted to control radio. Internet it cannot really be t compared to, internet should not be compared to television, it should be compared to radio. You know, and, and another factor here is that this has a lot to do, and this has everything to do with capitalism versus socialism. Because the human spirit is not compatible with capitalism and it's geared towards socialism. And that has everything to do with the monopolization of informa information today. Once you find out truth, you become angry with capitalism. That's why you don't hear talk of uh, anti-monopoly talk, because they want to capture it for themselves. Well, uh, when they use this word center, they use it to kind of calm people down. Okay, this, this is the mainstream, this is the center. We have been living with it for so many years, everything's fine. But they are censoring not only Trump's supporters, they are censoring some, uh, some the site called Punk Rock Libertarians on fa Facebook. Doesn't sound like Nazis or, you know, doesn't sound like leftist extremists to me. And, and uh, some statistics, uh, 559 pages and 251 accounts removed. It, are these all just, you know, extremists? Are these all people attracting uh, readers with shocking political news? Well, the political news are shocking. And, and, and the difference with China is that in China, the mainstream press is not calling for war. In the United States and in the European Union, the mainstream press very often uh, kind of switches itself into a war mode and we have them touting the war against Iraq, the war against Libya, the war against Syria. Well, that, this is the big difference that, with China. But it ties into, you know, that this is the outsourcing of censorship. Well, you and I talked about this early with the Atlantic Count, uh, uh, Council, is that Facebook, they just said, well, we'll have these fact checkers take care of it for us. First of all, they, they uh, abrogate any kind of responsibility. Well, we were our advisors, you know, so the, and, you know, for, for the mainstream, the Atlantic Council has sterling credentials. I don't think they have sterling credentials around this table and for many of the, um, uh, our viewers watching this program. Right, that, that's a good assessment. I, I mean, I have no objections to, to that. That, that's a that's a that's a pretty good assessment outsourcing censorship yeah and, that, and that's why at, at the end of the day Facebook is now essentially a publisher even though they claim to be a platform let's not forget when they first started they were saying they were a platform for communication for ideas they lied so to they wouldn't everybody. be regulated exactly exactly they lied to everyone and let's not also forget I've, I've lived in Silicon Valley these people that work in these companies the Facebook's the Twitter's the Google's these guys are not progressive, they're not conservative, they're not libertarians. They despise all these, all these groups. They are neoliberal elitists. These guys are the elite of the elite. They make huge salaries. They are the royalty, they are the tech royalty of the world, and everyone else were just a bunch of serfs. And they want to keep that. Exactly, they want to keep it. Uh, yeah, no, I think the outsourcing hits it yeah, spot on because uh, in the United States, uh, media freedom is or at least has been quite uh, sacred. And uh, But the whole argument is that these are private companies. They can choose who's going to be on their sites and they can choose the rules uh, for the platform. So uh, 
but and obviously they link themselves to certain yeah, but, politics. But, but what uh, happens is, is that I don't know if this was the original goal, but they are the public square now. I mean, they're much more than a platform. I, I, I think what you mean is private square or privatization of our lives as a neo feudalism. Uh, should know that neo feudalism and neo colonialism are large components of today's imperialism. Uh, but, I mean, I don't have much of a disagreement with what is said per se. You know, it, it's, it's, it's logical. What is that sound? W w what are they doing now? W w what is that? Uh, for the platform. So, uh, but and obviously they link themselves to yeah, certain but, politics. But what uh, happens is, is that, I don't know if this was the original goal, but they are the public square now. I mean, they're much more than a platform. They are the public square where ideas are exchanged. And they are unilaterally, without, without giving anyone any recourse, is that you're out. Okay? No explanation. Well, it is creating a lot of waves in the U.S., the fact that they are so brazen, this uh, tech company. So that's why you very interesting on the on the right in the United States. You see traditional free marketeers, conservatives now arguing that uh, yeah, Facebook should become a uh, utility, so essentially the state should absorb it because... Uh, but that's not a good solution. Uh, that's not a good solution. It, it, it might even compound it, depending on who's in power. But now, now, didn't I just say that they were going in, in that direction? The solution is not for the state or for privatization, but the public, the, the, a real public square, as in collective ownership democratically, of course, through the educational, and, you know, we're working out the bugs in our view about how to bring about this direct democracy, but it should be known that you, you got to stop conflating first world statism with common ownership to use that your voice may matter, that it wouldn't under a, you know, obviously it doesn't under a capitalist system. The construction is so annoying. I, I'm very sorry, everybody. I'm, I, we're gonna finish this up all the way through, but I don't think we're ever gonna do live streaming like this. Sorry, live streaming like this again because of stuff like this. I, I, some of this is very loud. I'm, I mean, I try to buffer the sound through this room, and it's, it's just still not working. I, I, I don't know why this is. We are never going to live stream again. I mean, I don't know. You guys, seriously, we can't do this. Not like this anymore. All things must be pre-planned. Seriously, all things. Well, I mean, I know I want to talk, but still. But, okay, how you could use it. But we do need some kind of a solution because <coughs> these tech companies, they, they will grow and they will continue to grow in the future as uh, that's where the main geoeconomic power will come in the future, especially now as we're going into this new industrial revolution. So I think... Uh, we have to yeah, uh, choose well, what do we do. You have these huge corporations become more and more powerful. Uh, are they going to be aligned with the state? If so, how? Do you have Chinese uh, system where they control it or do you have the corporate state of America or do you let them run free and essentially challenge the government like the oligarchs in Russia? Okay, in the on this program, so, I don't think we have any solutions no. for that problem <laughs> right yet. 20 seconds, Dan, before we yeah, go to well, break. Uh, <coughs> people have been talking about meddling during the last two years, I think. Well, I liked uh, the quote from Nicholas Burnaby, uh, the founder of the anti-media that was also taken down. He said, Okay, if we're talking about meddling, removing 800 politically, uh, 800 politically oriented media for deletion, you know, isn't that meddling in elections right before the November midterms? That is meddling. And, it's, and, it, and they determined who's in and out in that meddling. All right, well, that was very interesting. And we are now going to go to the second part of this episode of Crosstalk, where... I will continue to give commentary on everything that is said. Okay, let me go to Glenn here. Let's sh uh, ship gears to Saudi Arabia and the mysterious disappearance of a dissident Saudi journalist. Uh, this uh, gets into um, much of uh, uh, what Donna had predicted about the distance that could occur between uh, America and Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's getting really loud here. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I mean, I think that that's... What is that? 
anyway, um, this, this has, uh, this has to do with, uh, with, um, the missing journalist, Shoshi, I think he's called, and what this is going to amount to in the geopolitical relations between the United States of America and Saudi Arabia. I don't agree with everything that is about to be said as we're streaming through this again. Uh, this is still on live on RT. Um, it's very hard to concentrate with that out there like this. We are never doing the, the live feed again, okay? We are not doing this again. Ever. I'm losing my train of thought. Seriously. Just recap. Okay, let me go to Glenn here. Let's sh uh, shift gears to Saudi Arabia and the mysterious disappearance of a dissident Saudi journalist. This is a big story. Uh, yes, it definitely created a... Uh, it's become a very awkward component of the... Awkward? You're always good for understatement. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, it's yeah. his Norwegian blood, I think. <laughs> so it yeah, appears that he was uh, murdered, and of course this uh, yeah, doesn't uh, bode well for the relations between the United States and Saudi Arabia. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of uh, strategic and financial interest in maintaining this partnership. So. Uh, my best guess is that uh, the Saudis will throw a lot of money at this and we will eventually see it go away. Um, but uh, I guess, yeah, coming to the defense of the Americans, uh, I would say that they, they are put in a difficult position because as they do have this uh, strategic interest they have to pursue and at the same time they have to harmonize this with uh, what appears to be yeah, well, moral values or yeah, uh, I, ideological I, I consistency. I always like that, you know, that, that kind yeah. of um, uh, turn of phrase where you have common geopolitical interests but not values. Okay. Much of the official story concerning the events of 9-11 is tied into the Saudi royals. By the way, the mainstream media line is not the same thing as the official story. I hate it when 9-11 truthers claim that the official story says this or that the official story says that when actually the mainstream corporatized media is only pushing a fictional narrative rather disconnected from the official story. Fucking construction. I would like to say that I don't think that America is going to remain allies with the Saudi royals forever. You know, the royal Saudi families are imperialists who could easily do business with other imperialists, such as Britain, who they already have relations with. Donna Newman and myself both agree that the Saudi royal state, for its own security, will in time divest from America, you know, leaving Israel as the only ally of America. You don't think so? Look at the trends. Look at the way it's going. I mean, everybody is looking at the facts and they're seeing Saudi Arabia involved and Trump is a populist who promotes Islamophobia. Just, 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 just think about this. Really think about this for a second. The Saudi royal family will in time divest from America. Or, or not, but I think that it will, so does Don and Newman. I mean, it, really, really, think about it. I think this is going to continue for a while here. We know that um, uh, President um, of Turkey, Erdogan, is in some kind of joint investigation. Well, I, I tend to think this is a one-way negotiation. <laughs> Erdogan is going to extract a lot from the Saudis because apparently it's the Turks that have all the forensic evidence, the communications, all this. As far as we know, it has not been released to the media, but that's a very powerful card they're playing. Marvin. Marvin, you're, you're not listening to me. I don't hate the birds. I'm only saying I'm sure without the door, you can hear all the sounds outside, including the birds. That's all. And make sure that you tell Uri that he knows that... Oh, oh shit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we cut in. Sorry. Um... Yeah? Really? Okay, yes, Donna. Thank you. Okay, um... You wrote this? Okay. Uh, on the subject of Turkey, we know that the only true geopolitical ally of Israel was Turkey for the longest period of time. However, with the flotilla incident and now with Trump's U.S. Embassy decision, 
we see a shift away from the former geopolitical map. Saudi royalty is close to Americanism and has gotten even closer, which means Saudi royalty is getting closer to Zionism. The Qatars are now showing their first truly big split from Saudi royalty. With Khashoggi's murder, Saudi royalty is seeing a first rupture from Americanism, which will most likely blow over. Is this it? Okay. Until another rupture. However, instead of this destroying Saudi power, the royal families of the House of Saud are more likely to work with the UK, EU, and other imperialist players because globalism will most likely not surrender to Americanism, which is declining in its imperial hegemony. Donna, you just wrote all this? All of it, just now? Wow. Okay. All right, so, um, yeah, I'm sorry, everybody. Um, this, this thing is on live, and, you know, um, once we're done with this, we're done with this. I'm, I'm not even sure if we're going to be able to put this out. I don't, I don't even know if I'm going to put this out. If this gets put out, it's because people will petition that we put this out, which has to be decided between myself and Donna Newman. Uh, the construction, by the way, you're hearing everybody, is due to the fact that this office building is currently without a real front door. And we are having it replaced right now. And we are having repairs also right now. To, to make it even worse, there is construction going outside. And th this is all happening while you're hearing truck shipments uh, coming in today, while we decided to do this stream. This, it, th this stream is a, it, 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 it is a cut to comment, a program made by Marvin and Uri, by the way. Uh, they do great work for us here. And this is the first and last time we were going to use it. And if you guys hear this on YouTube, it's because we are petitioned and me and Donna don't object to putting it out. Although, if this gets put out, understand that it was put out very much against my will. Um, anyway, is that it, everybody? I mean, there's nothing, she didn't, she didn't write anything else. No. Um. Alright, so I'm going to put my own thoughts into this now before we cut back into cross chalk. I think... I think... We're going to see massive upheavals, and I think this is going to go back and forth, but I ultimately agree with Donna Newman on the matter that the Saudi royal families are going to disconnect eventually from Americanism, and I don't think that that's going to destroy the Saudis, because the Saudis just have too much oil, and I think that it will go with other imperialist fractions that make up globalism. And by the way, the term globalism is correct because of the term globalization. Yeah, um, th there, there could be more to say about that, but we, we really just need to get back to what we were, what we were doing. We're, we're going back to the feed. To cross talk. I think the crown prince has to be very worried, mostly about his reputation. Yeah, and I think the Turks shared that information with the U.S. Judging by Trump's 60-minute uh, interview, Trump also knows this is a huge, huge story. Erdogan is going to get a lot of leverage over Saudi Arabia. He's going to get a lot of money from them. The U.S. is going to sell a boatload of arms to Saudi Arabia. At the end of the day, I agree with you, they are going to reconcile. But MBS most likely, as we were talking before the program, may be on his way out. Good riddance. The guy was a sociopath. Sociopath. Okay, um, again, this is the first rupture. That's all that needs to be seen. It is possible that the Crown Royal Prince will be, you know, over, you know, removed, but not likely. It's possible, it's just not really likely. This is only a first rupture. It, these things take a while. Just like the flotilla was the first rupture for Turkey, you know, having problems with Israel. The real nails in the coffin has to do with the U.S. Embassy being moved to Jerusalem. 
showing that the Oslo Accords was always a land grab con, one-sided on the side of Israel and never Palestine. He, he has been doing this for the better part of a year. He's been bombing Yemen. He's been taking other Saudi oligarchs and billionaires, locking them in hotel rooms, torturing them. And was it not three or four months ago, Peter, that MSNBC, Washington Post, New York Times, CNN were hailing him as what? The, 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 li the reformer the prince, the liberal prince who's, who's bringing, uh, who's letting women go to movie theaters and letting them drive. And he's, he's the savior of Saudi Arabia. And it took, you said it best before the program, it took um, the murder, most likely, the murder of this journalist. And the only reason it's opening up the eyes is because he was working for the Washington Post. It took this murder right. for That's everyone right. to it's open up their, their eyes. one of their own here. But John Brennan yes. came out and... I'm glad you pointed out the article <laughs> to me, so I won't be a spoiler. Go right ahead, Dima. Well, John Brennan published an article in the Washington Post. Isn't he a brave man? You know? <laughs> Uh, he published uh, the article headline, The U.S. should never turn a blind eye to this sort of inhumanity. Can you read the last sentence here? I have it here. I have it here. I'll read it here. You can read um, it. Uh, the, me the message would be clear. Here we go. The United States will never turn a blind eye to such inhumane behavior, even when carried out by friends, because this is a nation that remains faithful to its values. Absolutely. That was John Brennan. He was, what, well, the Darth Vader of droning? Dima. Well, John Brennan, as he admits in his article, has worked in Saudi Arabia for five years with the same regime that destroyed Mr. Khashoggi. And uh, he basically uh, says that, according to my information, it couldn't be done without the prince knowing it. Uh, end of quote. Well, for whom better than Brennan to know such things? He got permission from President Obama every night for killing hundreds of people by drone attacks. You, you see, that that I appreciate. That's a brush of fresh air for that to be mentioned. Nobody really gets on to what, what Obama did to pave the way for much of what uh, Trump is doing now. Just as, you know, Bush paved the way for Obama, Obama paved the way for Trump. I'm so glad that that was mentioned. Highly appreciate it. This is actually why we like crosstalk. This is why. Suddenly we have this eye-opening moment from Mr. Brennan. He says, uh, he writes in his article, we saw the well-publicized detention of more than 100 princes, senior technocrats and businessmen in the Ritz Carlton Hotel. Well, I read in the New York Times that it was needed for reform. There was Thomas Friedman who came in person to talk to Mohammed bin Salman. He was How seduced nice it by was. the crown prince. He was seduced. He said he was worn out by his reform agent there that he has been listening to during the whole night. You know, these well, are real. It was probably the, one of the most expensive PR campaigns ever done, okay, in the history of PR. And then also, just a moment, Mr. Brennan also noticed that MBS ordered the arrest of activists some of whom were actually women. He allowed the women to drive, and we thought it was just, it could excuse him for anything. He ordered some of them arrested. Well, this is the point about the ultra liberals. They are, they make privileged groups, but if a member of that privileged group, a handicapped person, a woman, or an, a, a representative of the sexual minority is against them, then you can crack down on that person. It... <coughs> It might need to be said that this is an issue of misogyny, uh, not really patriarchy. A lot of people look at the Saudi royal system and say it's patriarchy, but that's not actually the case. In patriarchy, women have rights. They have different rights than men, but they have rights nonetheless. I mean, a lot of people like to bash the Jewish altar orthodox, but what people don't know is there's a lot of the rules that have manifested, manifested the way because of the way the ultra orthodox felt their inversion on them due to the Enlightenment movement. Of course, they would have just called themselves Orthodox, but that gets into a whole history of the various Jewish tendencies. And, you know, it, Dr. Weisfeld has held the position that uh, Jewish Reform, Jewish Conservative, Jewish Reconstructionist, that that's basically based on the Protestant movements within the Western Church, and that would be correct. However, this is kind of off track. The way you have to understand the... Saudi royals is not through the lens of theocratic Islam, because that would be so inaccurate. You have to understand it as a technocratic pro-austerity 
misogynist regime of royalty, which, by the way, is forbidden in Islam. Another thing that should be mentioned in the Jewish theocratic kingdoms of Israel, Judah, and such, the kings were not monarchs. They would have, in fact, been more like the, the sultans that you would have seen in the early Islamic period before the Ottomans, which, by the way, that's not a strike against the Ottomans. Um, we're going to have to start putting out where we stand with a lot of this. I'm, I'm seeing this more and more now, and why we prefer direct democracy over anything else. And why we're looking at things in a... Well, I'm digressing, like, badly. But the point being is is that this is just... These are just the thoughts that come when... Really? All right, we're just going to go to the next part. Well, John Brennan, as he admits in his article, has worked in Saudi Arabia for five years with the same regime that destroyed Mr. Khashoggi. And uh, he basically uh, says that, according to my information, it couldn't be done without the prince knowing it. Uh, end of quote. Well, for whom better than Brennan to know such things? He got permission from President Obama every night for killing hundreds of people by drone attacks. And, and suddenly we have this eye-opening moment from Mr. Brennan. He says, uh, he writes in his article, we saw the well-publicized detention of more than 100 princes, senior technocrats and businessmen in the Ritz Carlton Hotel. Well, I read in the New York Times that it was needed for reform. There was Thomas Friedman who came in person to talk to Mohammed bin Salman. He was how seduced nice it was. by the crown prince. He was seduced. <laughs> he said he was worn out by his reform agent there, that he has been listening to during the whole night. You know, these well, are real. That was probably the, one of the most expensive PR campaigns ever done, okay, in the history of PR. And then also, just a moment, Mr. Brennan also noticed that MBS ordered the arrest of active some of whom were actually women. He allowed the women to drive, and we thought it was just, it could excuse him for anything. He ordered some of them arrested. Well, this is the point about the ultra liberals. They are, they make privileged groups, but if a member of that privileged group, a handicapped person, a woman, or an, a, a representative of the sexual minority is against them, then you can crack down on that person more than on anyone else. Uh, if he is so concerned, Mr. Brennan, about women in detention, why doesn't he remind us of Maria Butina, who is just sitting there, a woman activist who drove and who liked to speak to, to the media? She is now in detention in she the United guns, States. Too. So, this journalist, um, um, Jamal uh, Khashoggi, he's put Donald Trump. His, his fate, whatever it is, has put Donald Trump in a very uncomfortable position because, um, of course, this, we can't, you know, you know, he says the U.S. can't stand for this, but as we've all agreed here, there's a lot of money at stake right here. Is it possible, and I think that Alex has already alluded to it, um, the West may be looking for a different partner in Saudi Arabia? Uh, well, that could be it. Uh, because it's not, a, you know, we have to remind our viewers, it's not a country, it's a, it's a family, okay? And there are other members of the family. Okay. Yeah, without the Saudis ruling it, it would just be Arabia. Hence the constant referencing to the Saudi royals that we name as such, as opposed to referring to Arabia, the actual country. Now, of course, it is. It, it, this is still possible that the prince shall be removed from his status. Um, but, you know, even though it's possible that this prince will be removed from the status, uh, it, it's just unlikely. But keep in mind that this is now officially the first rupture between America and the Saudi royals. The first. There will probably be others, but this one is a first rupture. Because it's not, you know, we have to remind our viewers, it's not a country, it's a, it's a family, okay? And there are other members of the family. Okay. Yeah, without the Saudis ruling it, it would just be Arabia. So yes, it is a family enterprise. But I think that uh, Trump put himself a little bit in this difficult position, because during the whole campaign he pointed out that the Saudis were the main sponsor of terrorism, and you know he would not bow to the Saudis unlike his predecessor. And, and then he had to flip. Yeah, well, he, he did recognize the strategic interest and also the commercial interest in maintaining good relations with the Saudis. So he went over there and you know paid his tribute like any other uh, American president. And uh, 
I think uh, now he's put in a difficult position. Uh, he might suspect this being a uh, well, a domestic issue because obviously people like Brennan would not have come out against Obama in this kind of way. So, uh, you know, he called Trump treasonous in the past for meeting with Putin. So, again, he's, uh, I think that it also reflects how American politics have polarized. So, the, if, if the opposition can really put Trump in a bad light, I, do I, I think they're likely to jeopardize the relationship yep. with Saudi Arabia by calling him out and essentially daring him to, to challenge this partnership. It's all so, part of, yeah. uh, by any means, um, um, unnecessary. Yeah. Alec, I think what's really interesting is that one of the things, the mantras that you hear about Middle East politics is Iran is the, um, uh, uh, the chief supporter of terrorism in the world. Even though, actually, uh, Iran is probably one of the most important um, beacons of stability, safety, and liberty in the entire Middle East. I mean, just, just keeping this real. What the hell? <sighs> really? I think what's really interesting is that one of the things, the mantras that you hear about Middle East politics is Iran is the, um, uh, uh, the chief supporter of terrorism in the world, okay? But you have, if in case, in this case, um, Khashoggi was killed by uh, so, uh, Saudi um, uh, intelligence uh, personnel in a foreign country, in a consulate, that is nothing less than an act of state terrorism. So it's kind of like that pot calling the kettle black here. Yeah, and when, when we do find the, the truth behind all of this, and like we said, we pretty much know what, I think most people are hinting at what happened. The Saudis, the family, will survive. They will, they will throw MBS under the bus in order to survive, because at the end of the day, the royal family are survivors. So I, I think MBS's days are numbered. I think Trump was hurt by what happened. Let's not forget that Jared Kushner spoke to MBS they, they said they spoke almost a whole night together and they were discussing policy and stuff. So, I mean, all of Trump's immediate family also got burned, got burned really bad. And you could tell that Trump did not like it. And you don't cross Trump. I think at the end of the day, Trump will take action if and when they decide to, to publish or to come out with the truth of what happened. Again, possible, but just really, really unlikely. This reminds me... Um, I was trying to convey this on our big documentary, uh, Jewish Bundist Diaspora Movement, in one of the two areas where I go off and rant. But, you know, the Alex Jones crowd, they always said, well, we don't have real capitalism, we have corporatism, even though corporatism is actually a type of classical fascism. But they, the way that they justify this is they say the state fused with the corporation, that's not capitalism, that's corporatism. Except that Donald Trump is a CEO. But at the end of the day, this is not like anything Trump has ever done. Trump can't deal with everything. I mean, he may, yeah, you make, you can't cross Trump, but you really can't cross, cross the Saudi royals. I mean, America trumps... Go figure. Trump's the Saudi royals, technically. However, the Saudi royals are strategically needed, and they have more friends than just simply America. So, could uh, the prince be out, out? Yeah, it's just unlikely. It's possible, but unlikely. Because the interesting thing is stressing the fact that it is a, a royal family sanctioning the crown prince is sanctioning the entire family. That's what makes it complicated. Well, let me remind our viewers who was the main enemy of uh, uh, President Erdogan and uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the president of Syria, Bashar al-Assad. So tell me about your enemies, and I will tell you who you are. Maybe if Mr. Assad has such terrible enemies, the people who are able to commit a murder and then hide it, maybe he's not so bad after all. That's what we have been told by the Western media for so many years. And again, uh, I think the Western media now will try to sell us the story that only Trump supported the Saudi family. It all started under him. <laughs> John Brennan is already writing it in his article. <laughs> Total absence of U.S. moral leadership on the global stage now. Well, well I mean... let me rem <laughs> remind our viewers that it was Obama who supported uh, Mohammed bin Salman's intervention in Yemen, which Mr. Brennan is now calling that disastrous foray into Yemen, end of quote. 
Brennan was in power when that foray into, into Yemen started. Obviously, it started with his full you know, support. It's very interesting, in it's very interesting Alex, because um, Glenn was absolutely right to bring in the domestic uh, politics uh, in the U.S. about this. Um, is that, and, and as Dima just said here, I guess history started two years ago because everybody else has amnesia. Huh. You know, I very much remember when George W. Bush was the president of the United States of America. Everybody would go on and on about it can't get worse than Bush. Then we had Barack Obama and the war acceleration the NDAA and everybody was like it can't get worse than Barack Obama to which my reply was always actually whoever comes after Barack Obama by principle has to be worse than him and now we have Donald Trump and everybody's saying the worst president ever you know it, it, it can't be any worse than, 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 than Donald Trump to which my reply is it has to be worse than Trump Trump is a very crucial part of this um, peeling off the mask that the United States of America is doing, and yet nobody thinks about that. There's a there's a there's a strange, very euphoric faith, and I do mean like devout faith, in the electoral process of the United States of America, which is completely racist. It is racist to believe in the United States of America because it is built on destroying the natives who were here first. It's incredible to me. It's absolutely incredible. I don't know how people go for this, but, you know, it's... I appreciate... I really appreciate Crosstalk for, for this reason. It blows my mind, the historical collective amnesia, the collective historical amnesia of the American people. But not really. It, it, it's, it's all about trying to tell, you know, we are good, we are good, we're not at fault, it's government. When really it's Americans are an occupying force on this soil, and it's wrong, and it should stop. Glenn was absolutely right to bring in the domestic uh, politics uh, in the U.S. about this. Um, is that, and, and as Dima just said here, I guess history started two years ago because everybody else has amnesia about what happened beforehand. I mean, remember we've stressed on this program over and over again. I've always talked about the, the envelope that Trump has in his pocket and he checks everything off for, for his reelection. Um, he inherited all of this, okay? It, it was not of his doing. I'm not defending Donald Trump. I think his relationship, um, his uh, enhanced relationship with Saudi Arabia is toxic to the core. <clears throat> Saudi, Saudi uh, relations with U.S. presidents have go back at least as far as George W. Bush. You know, the Bushes and the Bin Ladens, has anybody forgotten about that as well? And of course, Trump's relationship with the Saudi prince is toxic to the core. Of course, one can see where that relationship is, largely in misogyny, maybe? Am I the only one that picks up on that? I'll tell you something, I can smell a misogynist a mile away. Really? Yeah. And he's and it's coming back to haunt him. It was the first country he went to. First country. Let's not forget that. So so Trump does have some responsibility there, but I think he will take action. As far as Brennan goes, is it's not the same Brennan that was trying to overthrow and dethrone Trump? Is it's not the same Brennan that started Ukraine and the coup? Is it's not the same Brennan that started Syria? Is it's not the same Brennan that, that probably that started Russia, 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 and, and killed this Brennan and killed thousands of people in Yemen by drones. You know, um, it's amazing uh, Russia keeps getting thrown into the mix in the political discourse. You know, Hillary won the popular vote. Of course, she stole it from Bernie Sanders, and that's been kind of proven. But she she won the popular vote, and then Trump won through the Electoral College, which, by the way, cannot be hacked. So, therefore, there is no Russian influence onto Trump's presidency. Unless they wanted Hillary Clinton to win, which is not possible. 
I think I've said that before somewhere, maybe. But, you know, it's just... This is all just hilarious. The way that this stuff is... You know, you gotta love crosstalk, man. You really do. Th this is you a guy writing Yemen. <laughs> exactly. Yemen was the first victim of the drone campaign. And now Brennan is criticizing Mohammed bin Salman for this foray, senseless foray into Yemen. But also, Mr. Mr. I think Mohammed bin Salman has given us uh, a hint at who may succeed. He has nothing but praise in his article for Mohammed bin Nayef the former head of the Saudi intelligence, who was basically removed by Mohammed bin Salman recently. He says that uh, this person was deposed by the intolerant and vindictive crown prince, end of quote. Well, that reminds so, me of... So we have a retired CIA head that's involved in another regime change. Does this guy ever retire? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, gentlemen, that's all the time we have here. <laughs> Many thanks to my guests here in Moscow. And thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RTC. See you next time. And remember, Crosstalk Rules. All right. Well, that was uh, Crosstalk on this live stream experiment, which I regret any viewers that I'm pretty sure we're not going to do again because as everybody can hear in the background it, it can be unpredictable what happens when you do the, something like this live May, maybe this won't be the last time it's just I, I don't feel comfortable with this but it was good and as has been explained this isn't exactly on sequence the way that we're cutting into this um but the live yeah the live uh goes on repeat sort of and we're just cutting into it and as we have it on record we can even go back to previous moments if we want to at any point it's pretty advanced what Marvin Eliyahu and Uri Adia have invented um, but the next thing that we're going to bring you to is a deadline for jihadists to leave Idlib buffer zones passes what's next it's also here on today Day on October 15th, 2018. Oh. It's been a great, interesting experience, you know? And, um, I mean, this is a pretty cool um, invention. I don't know if it's necessarily unique, but it's good for our software stuff, but I'm just not comfortable with using it anymore. But I look forward to... Um, seeing what else we can do, and maybe we'll do it again. I just, I just don't want to do this anytime soon again. This is very difficult, especially with the noise that I'm pretty sure is being picked up by the recording. Yeah. So anyway, this next part is, uh, what's it? Yeah. Okay. Dead. Let me see that. Deadline for jihadists to leave Idlib buffer zones passes. What's next? Good morning, everybody. We're dealing with construction in the background. Ha! Ah. Yay! A deadline for terror groups to pull out of a buffer zone around Syria's last rebel-held stronghold has passed, with jihadist fighters staying put. For more details now, we're joined in the studio by Igor Zdanov. Um, Igor, with this deadline now gone, what are the chances then of uh, these jihadists moving? Well, actually, this is the biggest intrigue about this whole deal, because today is the second deadline, and today was the day when uh, all rebel factions who are in the northern province of Idlib, uh, today they were supposed to make the biggest concessions of all. They were supposed to withdraw troops from the 20-kilometer or so buffer zone in the province. Now, one thing to understand about Idlib... Uh, it is a mess in a sense that there, there are so many groups that are controlling various pockets of the province and it is indeed one hell of a task to control and to see through their withdrawal, their compliance with the deal. What's not making things easier is because, for example, uh, the Al-Nusra Front, the most formidable force in the Syrian province, hours before the deadline, uh, here's what they had to say. We have not abandoned our choice of jihad and fighting towards implementing our blessed revolution.
announced the deal publicly like a couple of other groups, more radical groups have done. But like uh, when you look at their statement, it does indeed look that they are ready to continue the fighting and that they are willing to keep on fighting the Assad army. And so it doesn't really look like compliance with the deal. Mm. Now, this deadline was only one of the things, wasn't it, agreed on by Turkey and Russia. What were the other key points? Well, the, another key point was to for rebels, for all the factions in Idlib, to withdraw heavy arms from the buffer zone. They were, this was like a first step. So, and uh, it was supposed to happen on the 10th, uh, so five days ago. And uh, largely, uh, from what we've seen so far, we haven't seen too many reports of violations of that. So largely, even despite... Uh, some even despite groups denouncing the deal so far so good it seems that they're complying but one thing is to withdraw heavy weapons and another thing is to withdraw your own fighters essentially moving front lines closer to what they see as their home as their last stronghold and uh, for Turkey uh, it is de facto a guarantor uh, of uh, the, the guarantor of the rebels complying uh, with the deal it is again a very difficult task because not only there is a lot of groups to control to see them complying with the deal but also sometimes groups say one thing and then do another and uh, but so far Russia has been saying that well Turkey is doing its best to see the deal succeed the agreements are being fulfilled with our Turkish partners having the main role they're actively fighting to get all groups to cooperate so ultimately today and the next following days will be key to understanding if the deal is on the way to being successful or whether the groups, all those various factions in Idlib, whether they will continue fighting. Okay, Hugo, thanks for the update. That was Hugo Zidanov there. All right, now we are at the last video that we will give you on the live stream. And yeah, we have not been commenting on anything except... Well, except the uh, the blowhorns, which was you know from from um, from cross track from cross talk. <laughs> When's the door gonna get back on? Right. So the only thing we provided commentary for here is cross talk and. That was not the plan initially, but I guess I didn't understand that there was going to be all the construction and that we wouldn't have a door. So even when we're in between construction and the construction's just not on anymore, the traffic is still on because all the noise that is not on inside a building is on when there's no door. And sometimes this door in this room is not enough to buffer the sound. Well... This is going to be the final video. It's what if the entire Middle East was like Israel? Can sorry, what if the entire Middle East was like Israel? Trump can dream. And I really don't want this I don't want this published, guys. I really don't. If if you all want it published, you will have to ask me and Donna, but I, I may not concede to it. I, I mean, I'm, and I may pressure her just not to let this video come out. <laughs> I know that you guys are amused, and I'm glad you're amused. Does anybody think about how Dr. Weisfeld's going to consider me unprofessional if this stuff kind of keeps happening? That's not very funny. All right, let's go. Apparently the Trump administration would have the whole Middle East be just like Israel if they had their way. Israel is everything we want the entire Middle East to look like going forward. It is democratic and prosperous. It desires peace. And it is a home to a free press and a thriving free market economy. So let's just take a moment and picture that. The entire Middle East would look at Donald Trump through the same eyes as Benjamin Netanyahu. Everyone in the region would hate Iran with the same fiery passion. Threat posed by Iran. Whose chief exports are violence, bloodshed, and chaos. 
Iran lied. Iran's path to the bomb. Iran's aggression. The danger that Iran poses. Iran should not be rewarded for its aggression in the region. And what would countries do to those they don't see eye to eye with? Follow the Israeli example and throw up a fence. In our neighborhood, we need to protect ourselves from wild beasts. At the end of the day, as I see it, there will be a fence like this one surrounding Israel in its entirety. Now, in that scenario, all of Israel's neighbors would likely be blocking them in. And of course, every country in the Middle East would be broken down into pro and anti-government, building barriers. And Israel has shown us exactly how those rebelling would be treated. Let's not forget about the lovely nuclear stockpile Israel is believed to have. The region would be filled with nukes. Not that they'd ever admit to having such weapons. Right, Bibi? A yes-no question for you. Does Israel have nuclear capabilities and nuclear weapons? Yes or no? Uh, we've always said that we won't be the first to introduce it, so we haven't introduced it. Is all of that what the Secretary of State had in mind? Let's hope not. You really have to see this in the context of American domestic politics and not really in Middle Eastern politics. Certainly for uh, Israeli Jews, Israel is a very successful country. It's often referred to here in the United States as startup nation. What kind of reception does it have in the Middle East? Terrible. Israel is very unpopular for the way that it has been pushing aside the Palestinians and oppressing the Palestinians. Netanyahu and Trump have found a brotherhood in their policies towards the Palestinians and towards the Saudis and uh, towards Iran. They've, they've really aligned themselves very closely, and that's what you were hearing at the Jinsa speech by Pompeo. All right, well, that about does it then. That was, that was the experimental live stream. Um, I don't see what the point will be to make further edits because, you know, we, we just, I've already explained how it works. And further edits to it in any way would just simply mean that we were going to go through with it. We have the slideshow ready, the two basic pictures. Um, I don't think that this is going to go up on YouTube, but if it does... I sure hope it provides some type of entertainment value. And I hope that the commentary that I gave to Crosstalk was enough. I'm not going to give commentary to the others. I didn't give commentary to the others. And we're not going to redo all this. By the time the live stream is... It, it, by the time we would get back into it, it would be different a different set of videos anyway. So... Uh, oh boy. Yeah, you can can anybody can everybody hear that? <laughs> really, man. Well, so we can do more with Donna Newman now that she has purchased a new headset. Me and her were sharing the headset. The headset would be brought back over to my primary place of residence and I'd bring it back over to the office. We had actually seven headsets at one point, but there has been a lot of drama that I don't care to get into. So um, me and her can now correspond uh, because she will speak in her room in the office and I will speak in my room in the office and we can correspond that way. And that's important that we are in two different rooms, otherwise you're just going to hear an echo. So that's it, um, our one and only attempt at the live stream. This was the only way we could get Donna to speak on our channel. So uh, please like the video. And I don't quite remember the cut through process in the live stream. This was back in October 15th of last year, 2018. I hope everyone is looking forward to our Upcoming trilogy, our upcoming trilogy against white supremacy, which will also be featuring Donna Newman.